Now, I have always traditionally believed that when the Battle of Armageddon takes place, we're going to have Russia and all of her satellite countries against America and NATO and all of those countries, and they're all going to go duke it out in Israel. Uh, I would like to present a different picture this morning. And please don't throw anything except money if you don't agree with me. <laughs> so, there we go, Battle of Armageddon. The subject matter is serious, but there's four thoughts I want you to take as we're starting this message. Number one, God is always in control. It doesn't matter what's going on in this world, no matter how the world looks how bad it looks. God's always in control. We may feel out of control, but God is always in control. Number two, God protects those who put their trust in Him. Do I have an amen to that? Amen. He always does. He always protects. And you know what? It's going to be interesting on the day of judgment when we look at our lives and God's going to show us how many times He spared us from accidents and death and all kinds of sickness. We will be so amazed we will be down at our feet in great exultation and joy over how many times God has protected and looked after us. Number three, God reveals. He's a revealing God. Remember Nebuchadnezzar talking to Daniel about the dream? He admits that there is a God in heaven who can reveal, even with the Chaldean saying, there is no God that dwells in flesh on earth with men who can reveal this which Nebuchadnezzar is talking about. And yet Daniel revealed there is a God who does do that. So God reveals ahead of time. So why? We don't have to worry. God is already there knowing what's going to happen. And number four, in God, faith, not fear. We have faith in God, not fear. God doesn't want us to be a fearful people because fear is bad for your emotions. Fear is bad on your body. A lot of people have to take pills and things to quiet down their hearts when God is the one who gives us peace. That's why I like Jesus who said, Shalom, peace. So let's go and read the first six verses. Now I'm going to bring a little different. We'll see how you'll take this. The word of the Lord came unto me saying, Ezekiel 38, Son of man, set thy face against Gog. All right? Why is it against? Because this is uh, someone that God has a prophecy against. The land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn thee back and put hooks into your jaws and bring thee forth and all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma of the north quarters and all his bands and many people with you. The traditional Church of God way of looking at this is you've got Russia and America on opposite sides, Russian satellite countries who are thinking of uh, years past it was going to be the Ukraine, it was uh, uh, Hungary, it was all of these countries that were controlled by Russia. And then we have Britain on the other side, Muslim Confederacy, NATO, China and Israel. So this is kind of what we have is these are the bad guys. These are the good guys. And I always like that it, we're on the good side. God's going to come and win. Woo -hoo! I'm, not, I'm not so sure about that anymore. And I'm going to tell you why. Let's understand an important point here as we begin this study. And number one is Ezekiel's prophecy is not with America in mind. He wasn't thinking of America. God wasn't thinking of America. It is not. Israel is the focus. This is where God is focusing on. Everything that's being talked about is the Hebrew people in mind. All right? So if we can come with that understanding, we're going to realize this is not uh, for as many countries as we had thought about. So grant me a little grace here before you start giving me some looks. All right? 
God's judgments come on those who come against Israel. This is the point God is bringing about, that judge, God's judgments are against those who have come to attack and destroy Israel. And to put America in the picture, we're reading into it. Now, that's been happening with many people over the last century. Well, this is how we understand this is what's going to happen. America's on the one side, Russia's on the side, and it's going to be this great war. The nations that are aggressively moving against Israel is Gog, Magog. Those are the first ones. We would think of that as Russia and the satellite countries, whichever they will be at that time. It has Persia, which equals Iran and Iraq, that area. Ethiopia and Libya. Now, some people have put in there Egypt. I'm not so sure about Egypt. I'm not so sure about Egypt. Gomer, Turkey or southern Russia. And Togarma, Turkey and or Syria, or could be Armenia. These are the areas. So, let's take a look here. Magog, Gomer, Meshek, Togarma, Tubal, Persia, Foot, Libya. I don't know where they've got Cush in there, maybe on another reading. But I am wondering about Egypt, because when it lists the country, Egypt is not in there. Now, how is it going to happen? You see Russia is up here, right? They're going to come down. But you know what? I always said, well, they have to come down. You know, they've got troops stationed in Syria already. I'll go into that in just a moment. So you've got all of this coming up from the north, this area here. And if you take Iraq and Iran coming in from the east. If, can you look over here and see this? The Golan Heights. Israel took the Golan Heights, 67 and then 73. So they, where the border was at the Sea of Galilee and straight down, they've got this Golan Heights and Israel will not let that go. You know why? Because it is higher up. When you're in the Golan Heights and you're looking down at Israel, you're looking into like into the valley. All right, am I right on that, uh, Jenny? So it's higher up and Israel does not want to let that go because otherwise it's easy for them to shoot artillery, anything else. When you've got the higher ground and you're coming into Israel, It'd be really quick. So Israel controls that land. They don't want to let it go. One verse that we should pay attention, and let's go back to that. Let's go to verse 4. And it says, And I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws. What does that mean? I'm going to force you to come down. If we look at a horse and you put uh, the bit in its mouth, it goes where you want it to go. Well, this is hooks into the jaw. And what they have is Assyrians, what they did when they would capture armies, they would put a steel hook or iron into the jaw and you went wherever they pulled you. That's the same idea with Russia. He's going to force Russia to come down. He says, I will put hooks into your jaws. You see? He's going to force them to come. And I will bring you forth and all your army, horses and horsemen. So you go so, so we get the idea. This is not maybe Russia's idea, but God is going to force them to do this. And I want to get to the idea of Egypt. Remember? Moses, they're all gone. Everyone's left the country. They buried their dead. And then what happens in the Pharaoh's heart? Hey, why did we let them go? We need to go get those people back. And we're going to find later, this was God behind the whole deal. And it's going to be God behind Russia coming. And I will turn you back and put hooks into your jaws. And I will bring you forth. You see, that's by force. And all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor. And if we look at Ezekiel's day, he would not know how to describe what army is coming. So he just says all kinds of arm bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. The thought uh, is, I'm going to force you to come down. Remember the scripture? Let's go there right now. Is he, Exodus 14. Exodus 14, verses 5 to 9. Exodus 14, verses 5 to 9. <clears throat> And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. 
And the heart of Pharaoh, you got that? The heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why have you done this? That we have let Israel go from serving us. And he made ready his chariot and uh, his chariot and took his people with him and took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt and he pursued after the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out in a high hand. You know, uh, you would think they learned the first time when you lose 10 to nothing to God, why, why do you want to go out after the people? Right? Verse 9. <clears throat> But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea, uh, by the sea beside Pi-Hiroth before baal Zephon. All right? So you get the idea. They're going. We're going to get you guys. You may have gotten all our firstborn, but we're coming after you with vengeance. And, and they were not coming with a welcome wagon, believe me. So the question is, who brought the Egyptians out? Let's go to verse 4, same chapter. God is speaking. I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all this host that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so. I want you to take that same idea that's being spoken of here. God says, I am going to be honored upon them. God is going to be honored upon Gog and Magog by bringing them down by force so that he can destroy them. So we need to understand one thing. Should we be fearful when we see that Armageddon is coming? No, because God destroyed the Pharaoh's chariots and all of that army before Israel because God was judging them and his vengeance had come. If you read, going back to Ezekiel 38, God is going to destroy Gog and Magog. He's bringing them forth for judgment. He is not bringing them forth to destroy Israel. He's bringing them forth to destroy them. Now, if we can understand that, we can have a good idea of what's taking place. I used to fear Armageddon, and maybe some of you did when you were younger too. Am I ready for God's coming? What about all of this? We don't have to worry. What God is going to do is destroy them, just like he destroyed the Egyptians. Now, let's take a look. We saw Gog and Magog. Here we've got Gomer, right here, and all of this area, which is in Turkey. So that's another uh, one of the nations that was listed. Anciently, Turkey was home to the Ottoman Empire. And the, of course, they lost in World War I, and they, uh, they lost their country. They are now part of NATO, but I would tend to believe they're going to lose, NATO is going to lose Turkey. Why? Because Erdogan is a pro-Islamic leader, and he wants an Islamic state for Turkey. And the problem he has is, if you're going to be part of Turkey, you're going to have a problem with that. So, uh, I believe things are going to change for them. Ezekiel, let's go on now to verses 7 to 12. Back to Ezekiel. <clears throat> Ezekiel 38. And verses 7 to 12. Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company, he's talking to Gog and Magog, that are assembled unto you, and be thou a guard unto them. After many days you shall be visited. In the latter years you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste. But it is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell all of them safely. Is Israel dwelling safely now? <clears throat> you shall ascend. He's talking to Gog. You shall ascend and come like a storm. You shall be like a cloud to cover the land. You and all the bands and many people with you. Now, aren't, don't we read in one place of 200 million? Is it, in, is it in Revelation? I forget where it is. Thus says the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at that same time shall things come into your mind and you shall think what? an evil thought. And you shall say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. Do you know that Israel was not a land of unwalled villages till about a hundred, little over a hundred years ago? They always had walled villages. Why? To protect themselves. 
You go to Israel now, and there are no walled villages anymore. All right? So this is the time factor. I will go up again to the land of unwalled villages. That never happened in the past. They always had walled villages. Now they don't. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. To take a spoil. So what is he coming to do to take a spoil? Do you know that Israel has a vast quantity of natural gas? Do you know, I don't know how many years ago, they said that Israel had the most gold. And do you know why they had the most gold? They would buy all the old computers from years ago, back in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Do you know why they bought the computers? Because they are lined with gold. They would use gold to line the wires because gold was found to be a substance that would keep your computer good. They're buying up all these computers and, use, and have all this gold. Wow. So that's what they did. They take a spoil. So they've got gas to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. So this is what they're coming to do. Hey, Israel can be ours. Prepare a great army. This is a pivotal verse that gives us a time that we're looking for in the latter years. We're in those years. Amen. There has never been a time, like I said, where Israel has not had walled villages except in the last hundred years. Now all their villages are not built without walls. I mean built with walls. They don't need them anymore. So this is the time period. And are they dwelling safely right now? Yeah, do you know why? They're making peace with a number of nations. But when you've got the uh, United States as your ally, you don't really have a lot of worries. It's unfortunate. I think they should be relying more on God than on, on another nation. So let's go now to verses 10 through 12. That says, The Lord God, it shall also come to pass at that same time. Shall things come into your mind? So Russia decides that Israel is vulnerable and we're going to attack. Land of unwalled villages. Why would Russia think this, knowing that America defends Israel? Israel has always had America, and America says, we are going to maintain their integrity. That's what they say at the UN. Russia knows this. Unless U.S. cools in its relationship with Israel. You remember Barack Obama? He didn't have much for Israel at all. He didn't care for Israel. Let's go to Jeremiah, the 30th chapter. Verses 12 to 14. Jeremiah 30, verses 12 to 14. Israel has sometimes turned up its nose at the United States when Israel wants to do what it's going to do no matter what, how the United States feels about it. They will do things on their own. So, verse 12. For thus says the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayest be bound up. Thou hast no healing medicines. All your lovers. Now that is a phrase that means all your allies have forgotten you. They seek you not, for I have wounded you with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, for the multitude of your iniquity, because your sins were increased. Now, that is referring to Old Testament, but I want to bring that in and say that's what's also going to happen in the end time. Why? You'll have to wait and see. So, Ezekiel 38, 9, clouds. Uh, when it talks about a storm covering the land in clouds, we would think about something like this. That is my thought. And I've got other... Uh, uh, ministers who've kind of thought the cloud is an airplane to cover the sky. When it says that Magog is going to come like a cloud, like a storm to cover the sky, boom. If you've got airplanes that are coming, that can easily be seen as, as a, a, a danger. Now, in the later years, that's the time frame. It is a historical fact that in the 1800s, you have... Uh, Theodore Herzl, 
He was the father of modern Zionism. And what he did was he worked to get Israel back as a country. So in the 1800s, they started having Jewish people start to come in the Palestine area, which at that time was a bunch of, of desert area and marshes. And uh, what's another word I'm thinking of? What do you have a lot of with a lot of water? What's that called? You have a lot of them in, in, in Louisiana. Swamps. That's all it was. And the people there couldn't do anything with the land for years. Here comes uh, Mr. Herzl, starts the National Jewish Congress, and starts buying land. They bought the land from those people. So when the people say, no, that's our land, well, go back to the people who bought it. They sold it to them. Here, we'll sell land. So they're selling. And guess what happened? They start getting in the land, and all of a sudden, all of this desert waste starts to go away. They don't have the problem anymore they did before. <clears throat> it's a fruitful country. They grow things over there like you wouldn't believe. And you know what's interesting now? We think of growth as in horizontal. And what they are doing is they're doing growth vertical. They have these big, long, high uh, apparatus in which they grow vegetables and stuff vertically which is amazing. No one's ever done that before. So they're growing all these vegetables. It's going down like this. And when they water, the water flows down and it gets all the vegetables. No waste of water. So they are growing like you wouldn't believe. They were never able to do that before Israel came back home. Now they are, uh, they've got fruits, vegetables, all kinds of stuff. Where before they couldn't touch it. They couldn't grow it. So let's go 38 verse 13. Ezekiel 38, and Ben's going to have to get a raise too because he's doing a good job there. 38, verse 13. <clears throat> Sheba and Dedan. Now here's where you may have some disagreeing with me, and that's fine. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all the young lines thereof. Now what we historically believed was that Sheba and Dedan, uh, they were going to be on the other side. With all the young lines, we always had an interpretation well, a lion means Britain because Britain on its coat of arms has lions, right? They have two lions facing each other. And then another one, they have a lion and a unicorn. And if you go to Canada, Canada has the lion. So we think automatically, well, this has got to be referring to uh, all of the states that are allied with, with, uh, with the United States. Young lions thereof shall say unto you, are you come to take a spoil? Have you gathered your company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, and to take away cattle and goods, and to take a great spoil? The language is not confrontational. If you read in the Hebrew, it's not, I'm going to come and fight you. I've looked at commentators, and they are saying they are envious of what they're doing. What? You're going to go do that? And we had, I had all along, the, okay, now America's going to come and say, you're going to attack Israel. Well, I'm going to come and I'm going to defend. You read nothing in here where it says that these nations go and fight with Gog and Magog. They do not. There is not a word in there that says they're going to fight with them. Oh, sorry. Let's go back there. You beat us to the punch. That's the kind of idea. What are you doing? You're going to go and attack them? Sheba, Deed, and Tarshish, and Young Lions are not advocates of Israel. Do you know why? We don't read it in the text. They don't go and defend Israel. They are asking, what are you doing? Saudi Arabia and the area of Spain with the Young Lions being princes. That's what the Young Lions also refers to. If you look, there are a couple of meanings. One is Young Lions and one is princes. But if you look, let's go over here to Sheba and Dedan. Here's Dedan and here's Sheba. Do you remember who went and visited Solomon? Who went and visited Solomon? The queen of, where did she come from? Right down here in this area. She came up all the way up here. This is, and guess who is in this land right now? Who's there? If we go over here, Saudi Arabia. Is Saudi Arabia going to defend Israel? And if you go to Tarshish, this is where Tarshish, this is Spain, the Iberian Peninsula. And we've got down here, Tarshish. Where was Jonah going? He was going to a place called Tarshish. So this is here. So are these ones going to fight against Gog and Magog? That's my question. 
what they are doing is, and you know with Saudi Arabia, my thought on that is, uh, is it possible Russia along the Muslim nation shall come and make a move and that America, if it was, would say it's too late. Do you know why? Look what Putin said last week and also into this week. If you come and try and stop me from entering the Ukraine, you're going to receive, and he says, whatever kind of, and he was int intimating nuclear war. What happens if Gog were to come down and say, don't bother, because if you do, it's a nuclear war? That's what they're doing with the Ukraine right now. Don't you dare bother. So who's helping Ukraine? How many nations? Militarily, with, with men on the ground? No one. Oh, we'll send you these bombs. We'll send you this stuff. They know Ukraine's going to be taken over. It's a foregone conclusion. They're just seeing how much time. <clears throat> Russia has at least 60,000 troops here in this area. You know why they're there? Along with fighter jets, tanks, and artillery stationed right here, 60,000. The last count, and they say it's probably more. So, but I'm just using 60,000 to be, to be uh, safe. You think, well, Russia can't come and do that? They've already got men in Syria. And if you've got Turkey up here in this north area, and by the way, Turkey had nothing bad to say when they went to the UN this week. They didn't say a bad thing about it. They abstained if they said anything. So Turkey doesn't have a problem. So Russia's up here. If they can come down, oops, I'm sorry. Let me go back. So they'll come down here. This is the way it looks from what history's seen. They'll come down here, invade here. Why? Because Syria has already have the troops in there. And they want to take the Golan Heights because as soon as they do that, then they're looking down on this lower area here and they come and invade. That's what they did in 1967 and in 1973. That's why Israel took this area because they don't want them to do that again. But if you have 200 million, according to what the Bible says, of an army coming from all locations, from the north and from the south and over from in the area here where you've got uh, the other Muslim nations coming into attack, And uh, Mr. Assad is a very good friend of Putin. That's why for him to have all these uh, troops in the area, it's not a problem for him. So the question is asked by this country, what are you doing coming down here? Who has the most oil as a country in the world? Saudi Arabia. Now, Russia has a lot too, so does America, but the pumping and, and then the stations right now is Saudi Arabia. So don't you think Saudi Arabia will be saying to Russia, what are you doing coming down here? Because maybe Saudi Arabia might be worried that Russia might want to take their land. Let's go back, let's go to 14 to 17 in Ezekiel. 14 to 17. <coughs> Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, Thus says the Lord God, in that day when my people of Israel dwell safely, shall you not know it? And we are living in a day and age where they would know it, right? You've got television telling you everything going on all the time. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with you, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. Now, if you've never seen a tank before, you're probably going to call them horses, right? Because you don't know what to look at them as. And you shall come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. That's the second time they uses the word cloud. And I kind of take that, and there's other ones that have done that too. The cloud is actually meaning uh, jets, helicopters that are going to come in. So they're coming not only on the ground with tanks, they're going to be coming in in the air. Come up uh, against my people as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. You've got that time period again. And I will bring you against my land. So there we got God is the one doing this. That the heathen may know me. Do you remember what God said to, no, to Moses? I will be honored upon Pharaoh and they shall know me. And that's the same thing he's saying in Ezekiel to Gog and Magog. You, they will know me when I come and judge them and I destroy them. That's the same thing that happened with Pharaoh. Thank you. Uh, Lloyd, I may have you come up here if things don't, uh, I get in trouble here. Eh? 
that the heathen may know me when I shall be sanctified in thee, O God, before their eyes. Let me ask you a question. When Nadab and Abihu went and offered strange fire to God, what happened to them? Do you know what God said? That he was sanctified in them? Even though he killed them, he is going to be sanctified in them when he kills them. He said to Pharaoh, I have brought you up. If I can just paraphrase, I brought you up and gave him this power so that I can reveal myself when he destroyed Egypt. So, where am I at here now? Verse 17, Thus says the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? When? The latter days. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. And then he's going to say, that's enough. When he sees them, he's the one who brings them, and then he gets angry at them when they come. In my face. <clears throat> so we'll stop right there for, for just a moment. So we see again the description of army coming to the promised land. Now let's go 18 to 22. I'm doing good for time. And it shall come to pass at the same time when God shall come up against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. I remember that happened another time. Do you remember what happened when uh, someone was coming to attack Israel? There was a great shaking in the land. You remember there was another time when the Philistines were coming to attack Israel and Samuel was there and he offered up a suckling lamb and all of a sudden thunderstorm came out of nowhere and it chased the Philistines. They were scared to death and they went back to their land, right? Well, there's a great shaking, an earthquake, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. And the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. That sounds like a great earthquake to me. Amen. And I will call for a sword. Don't we read that in Revelation where Jesus calls for a sword? Am I right on that? And all the angelic hosts that are coming for war? And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains. Now we call him Israel, but God calls them my mountains says the Lord God, every man's sword shall be against his brother. Where did we see in history where that happened, where the invading army had one sword against another warrior in their own camp? Where did that happen? Midian? Remember the Midianites came and one sword is against each other? And I think there's another time when uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer were there and a great shaking took place. And what happened? They were killing one another. The Philistines were. Has that happened before? Yes. And it looks like it's going to happen again. And I will plead against him. Who's that? Gog. With pestilence and with blood. And I will rain upon him, upon his bands, and upon the many people that are with him, and overflowing rain and great hailstones. Where do we read of great hailstones that are going to fall when Jesus comes again? Revelation. Great hailstones. About a talent. Can you imagine 75-pound talent hitting a tank? I don't care about that tank. It's going to be gone when that hits it. Fire and brimstone. So we're going to stop right there. God's anger will be aroused just like that against the Egyptians. Remember, God was angry with the Egyptians. He brought the Egyptians out to judge and destroy them. Remember that. He brought them out. Because remember we read in, in, in uh, 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 Exodus that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and brought him out. God is going to harden their hearts and bring them out. Who can stand before the wrath of Almighty God? No one can. God is bringing Russia down to judge and to destroy them. Why, why against Russia? Well, there's a number of different reasons. One can be is that they are a communist, atheistic country. Uh, probably maybe some of you don't know that, but Stalin and other uh, uh, other communist leaders have had delight in capturing and taking Jews and putting them into Siberia. They've always been anti-Semitic. 
Now let's go to Ezekiel 38, verse 23. And I think we're going to stop there for today. Verse 23. Now, you can say to me, all right, you said all of this stuff here. Uh, what is the point now going to be? Does God want us to be in fear because these things are happening? Now, uh, I just listened to a gentleman on the radio yesterday, and they said there's a possibility that the oil might go up to $150 to $200 a barrel. What would that put our gas at? If it's at three fifty nine dollars would that be 6 7 $8 a gallon? What would happen to America if that happens? Prices on everything are going to go up. So uh, I was talking with Jason a little bit the other day. Maybe it's a good time to plant a garden. Maybe it's a good time to take a look at planting a garden. Because if things don't... Paul, you've got a garden in your backyard. You can probably grow it a little bit, but uh, you, we may need to do that. And then you'll give me 10%. Here's the hope of the believer. Let's go to verse 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. What is the hope? When God comes back, He is in control. What are the four things we learned there? Number one, He is in control. What is number two? For those of you who wrote, wrote the notes there, what is number two? God is in control. He protects who? His people. What's number three? He reveals what's going to happen. Why? So we're not afraid. And what's number four? You guys are pretty good. That's the hope of the believer. No matter what happens in the world, God looks after His people no matter where they are. God will directly intervene by sending His Son Jesus to save the world. And I like the idea of revelation. We need to realize this is a time of joy, though the world is feared. Why? We're going to see Jesus come. Amen. That's my hope. And that's what we've got to tell the people today. There may be fear in the world, but we've got a hope, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Now I'm looking forward to Him coming. I'm sorry, but I am. Amen. I'm not going to be fearful of these events because God's in control. Let's go Hebrews 8, 10 to 11. Yeah, I want him to come quickly. The more I see all this stuff, the more I see, Lord, come quickly. But then again, I think about the other song. Uh, Wait a little longer, please, Jesus. There, there's still so many wandering out in sin. So we need to reach out to those people, brethren. Hebrews 8, 10 and 11. Hebrews 8. Now, I, I don't know how you feel about that. When I brought out about Sheba, Dedan, and Tarshish, and the young lions, I had always thought about that being, there is going to be an opposite force. I don't believe that anymore. I believe all these nations are going to come against Israel, and Jesus comes down and says, you're not going to do that to my country. He's going to come and fight. Because if we read back in there, it doesn't say they come and fight. All they do is ask a question. Are you going there? It doesn't say they come and make war. In fact, if we were going to Ezekiel 39, it talks about all the dead people of Gog and Magog lying all over the land of Israel. So my belief is they are going to come and try and destroy Israel. And God says, that's enough. I've had it. I've had it. So Hebrews 8, verses 10 and 11. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. You know what's interesting there? Is in Zechariah, when Jesus is in the midst of them, and they look at the wounds and they say, where did you get these wounds in your hands? They didn't know who Jesus is. Who are you and where, where did you get these wounds? those which I received in the house of my friends. And verse 11, And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. What is the good news? Jesus is coming back and the world's going to finally see who Jesus is. Because brethren, I would venture to say most of the people in the world don't know who Jesus is. But he's coming again. And we need to have that message for people. He's coming again. 
I used to live in fear, now I'm living in faith. If we're walking with Jesus, and you know, brethren, if all that I brought before you today is wrong, I am right on one thing. Jesus is coming again. And that, no matter what the fear is in our country, and brethren, I think we're going to have trouble in our country. But let's have faith in God. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you love and care for us as your children. And we take that promise. Now are we the sons of God. Now are we the daughters of God. And you love and you care for us. You never leave us. You never forsake us. Those are promises we are holding on to. And there's another promise. His bread and his water will be sure. We know that you will feed us if things get bad. Help us, Lord, to do our part by sharing the gospel. Help us to do in our part by preparing for that day. We ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.